Okie dokie. So um, my name is Carly and my presentation is going to be about existential therapy and finding meaning in life as treatment for adolescents and wilderness therapy programs. So a little bit about me um, in this picture, this is yours truly on the far right as a far left as a 16 year old. I join, I was sent to a wilderness therapy program at 16 and it was a extremely transformative time in my life. I was struggling with so much internal demons and this was just such a transformative time for me. I was having a conversation with my dad the other day and he was saying that of all the decisions that he's had to make in life, the hardest one was sending me to a wilderness program. And now being able to see the impact that it's made on my life, he says was really sad, like really sick, like gratifying for him to be able to see how good of a decision that was in hindsight. And it was really tough. And especially with COVID and the influx of death and disruption of routine that's going on in the lives of adolescents all around the world, the therapeutic and beneficial interventions associated with wilderness therapy are going to be needed now more than ever. Studies have shown heightened irritability, clinginess, and distraction in children's, children and teens age 6 to 18. A worldwide pandemic can spark multiple sources of anxiety um, and psychological stress for adolescents, resulting in depression, lethargy, impaired social interaction, and reduced appetite as some of the most reported symptoms. Reflections on the concepts of death and life can result in existential anxiety, which to an adolescent can have really significant consequences, which have the possibility to be even more life-changing with the elevated levels of isolation and reflection forced by COVID-19. Exploring meaning with adolescents has the potential to both be preventative and therapeutic as they encounter the challenging transitions of development, return back to school and create their new normal in this time of unprecedented uncertainty. Okie dokie, so. The life stage of development is centered around the essential task of identity formation which considers questions of self-concept, purpose, and the meaning of life in general. Erickson calls this period of life between age 12 and 17 identity versus role confusion. During this time, adolescents are searching for a way to define themselves, not just to fit in, but to feel like they truly belong in the world. Successful completion of this stage leads to a strong sense of self and unsuccessful completion of the stage can lead to role confusion where the individual is unsure about themselves and their place in society. Developmentally, adolescents are experiencing enhancements in their executive functioning, which leads to a capacity for independent thought into those existential questions. Adolescents who are actively exploring concerns surrounding their, anxiety, surrounding their existence may experience higher levels of anxiety and depression. An inability to find meaning can result in an attempt to find it in meaningless and extreme behaviors only meant to numb an individual so that they're momentarily satisfied and don't have to continue reflecting on those deeper questions. Teenagers' thoughts and actions can be seen as impulsive and arbitrary during this time. They might try new roles, behaviors, or activities that can be confusing for parents and caregivers. And the unfulfilled search for meaning creates an existential vacuum, which was created by Frankel to mean a pervasive sense of meaningless. Gutman states that an existential vacuum characterized by apathy, boredom, and a lack of motivation for achievements in life is increasingly common in our times and encompasses large segments of younger and older generations. When present, failure to attend to this foundational issue can undermine the impact of any treatment plan for adolescent depression. Blair, in his research on adolescents, discovered that a lack of meaning was often the root cause of their depression. This insecurity and inability to fill the vacuum could be seen externally as aggression, defiance, or drug use, or it could turn inward and manifest as suicidal ideation or attempts. Numerous studies have documented the relationship between a sense of meaning and purpose and well-being in adolescence, as well as the possible negative lifelong issues if these issues are not addressed. 
Yalom created a framework for approaching these existential questions of early adolescence, which he centered around fear. And he writes that an individual conquers four major fears in life, death, isolation, choice, and meaning. Each conflict presents a predictable set of defenses that soften the impact of the respective existential question when it is overwhelming or unmanageable. An example of the predictable defenses in response to the fear of isolation, especially with the influence of social media, um, would be the formation of social media dysphoria or FOMO, which means a fear of missing out. FOMO is driven by the universal de human desire of connection with others and is found in those who are struggling with an absence of relatedness in their lives. In an innate desire to fill the void of connection and avoid feeling isolation, adolescents can try to form rapid bonds with other individuals or groups without regard to if the new relationships they're creating will actually positively influence them. And this is amplified with the impact of a worldwide shutdown where teens are reinforced by those existential conflicts daily. Um, and a little bit about these pictures. So on the left is me and my little friend taking a break and I am actually whittling a spoon in this picture. And then on the right is probably maybe my second or third day and I had just taken a lovely tumble down the mountain. And I will never forget laying at the bottom of this mountain being just soaked in snow, just thinking where in the world am I? One week ago, I was home with my friends, no clue what where I was gonna be. And then a week later, I am down, taken a lovely tumble down a mountain. Never thought that would have happened. Okie dokie. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about logotherapy. Logotherapy provides an effective and holistic philosophical and perceptual framework towards addressing the existential angst present in most adolescents. Logotherapy was created by Viktor Frankl and logotherapy says that the primary drive for humans is finding meaning and purpose. Logotherapy is a psychotherapeutic technique for addressing existential conflicts and cultivating the promotion of social connection and shared purpose in service of discovery of purpose and transcendence of self. Frankel was inspired by the work of Alfred Adler and Freud who had their own schools of thought regarding the human condition that humans are motivated on a search for pleasure or power. According to Frankel, these two sources of fulfillment are actually impossible to intentionally truly obtain. An inability to fill the existential vacuum leads to an individual filling it with meaningless reasons, ending their lives feeling empty and void of meaning. The more you strive towards success and happiness, the more elusive it becomes. We are conditioned to believe that creating a state of good emotion is the goal of human striving, when in reality, it's finding your meaning and making a contribution to the world. Happiness and success are a result of meaning fulfillment. Logotherapy highlights four areas of life through which to discover your meaning, choices, uniqueness, responsibility, and self-transcendence. Whether you're surviving in a wilderness program or having struggles at home, regardless of where you are, you still have the capacity to choose how you respond to a situation. Even if other individuals and forces of nature have control over your external environments and some aspects of your life, Logotherapy says that you have the ultimate power and the responsibility in what you allow and don't allow to define you. Logotherapy reinforces clients' free will um, and responsibility over their actions and every individual's capacity for growth to change the course of your life. We become certain people by the choices that we make each moment and only we are responsible for our own recovery. You might not have control, like I said, over your journal forces, but you do have control in how you present and how you hold your suffering. If life is about balance, it's also about suffering because that's what makes life. A person who's never suffered does not know true happiness. No matter who you are, where you come from, you're always free to decide and change your course of action. The last aspect of finding meaning is self-transcendence. Um, and I wanna, I wanna include a Frankel quote that I really like that I think summarizes this aspect really nicely. Being human always points and is directed to something or someone other than oneself be it a meaning to fulfill or another human being to encounter. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is and the more he actualizes himself. What is called self-actualization is not an attainable aim at all. 
for the simple reason that the more one would strive for it, the more he would miss it. In other words, self-actualization is possible only as a side effect of self-transcendence. Frankel knew that no man knew what the future holds and there was always a chance for a different outcome and it required him expecting moments and hopes of a different future. I really like this quote, happiness is like a butterfly. The more you try to catch it, the more it flies away. If you focus on other things, it will come and sit on your shoulder. Now wilderness programs. So this is me cooking a lovely meal for my parents over a fire under a teepee, um, looking very rugged. So will the wilderness setting provides a really opportunity, a really great opportunity for adolescents to remove themselves from the harmful influence of society and be taken back to your really basic needs. For a set number of weeks, your main focus is to survive and meet your needs of food, water, and shelter. Davis, Berman, and Berman define wilderness therapy as the use of traditional therapy techniques, especially for group therapy in an out of door setting utilizing outdoor adventure pursuits and their activities to enhance personal growth. Wilderness therapy has been used with a number of at-risk populations stemming from those with mild anxiety to those with serious and persistent mental illness, gang members, sexual offenders, drug users, those on probation, survivors of sexual abuse, war veterans suffering from PTSD and has even been used for marital therapy. Wilderness therapy programs are usually several weeks long and involve group adventure type activities in nature. Through this process, the participant is to achieve a series of obstacle overcoming tasks related to wilderness survival. The structure of wilderness programs can be varied, but typically consists of a therapeutic program model with expressed outcomes, selective admission based on assessment, individual and group psychotherapy by qualified professionals, evaluation and aftercare planning for transition out of the program. Thankfully for me, I was slightly aware of my future play and had a little bit of time to prepare mentally. And the majority of my peers were, um, they call it gooned. And being gooned means that you were woken up in the middle of the night by two large humans who said, get up, come with us, you're coming to open sky, which is where I went and their parents would watch as their child was escorted out of their house by a pair of strangers, put on a plane and sent into the unknown. And this can really contribute to the lack of trust ex um, experienced by some kids. And the wilderness setting can be a really ideal location for adolescents to reflect on their existential struggles and facilitate a positive shift in mindset and perspective. Experiences in nature provide countless opportunities to elicit new meaning and provide a sense of understanding. Experiences with nature provide a stronger sense of connection with others as well as facilitate reflection on one's life priorities, possibilities, actions, and goals. And the research says that wilderness therapy has a positive effect on a person's mood, interpersonal relationships, social skills, and behavioral difficulties. So before I go into my interventions, I'm going to talk about um, a rough drafty theory that I'm currently working on with my mom and it's called PRISM. Oopsies, one quick sec. Yes, okie dokie. So PRISM is an original idea that I've been working on with my mom and it's still in its rough drafts, but I wanted to include it in my presentation because I think it's pretty interesting and it is an interesting way, I think, to conceptualize life and meaning. And the prism theories, I just want to introduce this to the existential psychology community and what I kind of want to base my interventions off of. And these interventions that I'm going to share later provide an avenue to restructuring those parts of you and discovering your own unique meaning. Um, and so prism, so to start, we have perspective. And the perspective piece is how do you look at the world? What is the way that you conceptualize and interpret your surroundings? Do you see only the bad or can you see the good? There's beauty and meaning in everything and you have a choice of what you're going to focus on. And that's perspective. Your relationships, being able to become your whole true self involves being able to step outside of yourself and care for others. Like Frankel said about self-transcendence. What is the impact that you have on the people around you? And you're a cog in the grand machine of life. And how do you play your part? 
How do you influence the functioning of the parts around you? Intention, live life intentionally and purposely. You become your thoughts. If you are a cog in the machine, what role do you play and how do you keep the machine running? Strengths are the ways that you can use your own power physically and emotionally. Frankel was able to access his power through his choices. Frankel knew that he always would have the freedom over his attitude and the way he responded to a situation. He was focused on surviving and using his mental strength to fight the death and depression around him for years. He could have given up, but so many times, but he chose to move forward because he wanted better for himself and he wanted more and do not underestimate your power. And last, I wanna talk about meaning and and obviously like kind of what's the, what's the meaning of your life? You're responsible for the way you contribute to and what you take out of the world. And what is your life task in each situation? I was having a conversation with my family the other day and we were talking about kind of what is our purpose on this earth as humans. And I was telling them that I feel like my purpose is vertical, but also horizontal. Vertical in terms of how do I make the world better around me and how do I make myself better each moment? Horizontal in terms of that I know that there's past versions of me, Carly two years ago starting grad school, eight years ago starting wilderness, and maybe this is a weird take on how time is relative, but those versions of me exist out there on some time frame. And there are future versions of me existing out there and I live for them as well. And so I spend my days on how I can improve this way, this way, but my soul journey is how I can improve this way in order to achieve my higher self. And part of improving the way, this way vertically is doing what I can to improve society, but also what can I enjoy from the world? I've spent so much time worrying about something that was gonna happen eventually or whatever. And now I wish I had spent that time being kinder to myself and enjoying each moment. So now I'm intentional with my time. And I know that there is a version of, uh, you know, a higher self version of me out there. And I believe that it's our purpose as humans to spend each day striving towards achieving that version. And we do this through our own unique ways. Okie dokie. So into my interventions. So these interventions are all based on existential tenants. And like I said, I kind of used PRISM mainly to write these. And these interventions in a wilderness therapy format and in the counseling room, as I will explain later, will enhance an adolescent's capacity to process and overcome the symptoms of their existential angst. Interventions designed to reduce existential anxiety and interpersonal and intrapersonal isolation enhance an adolescent's momentum in the process of recovery. And all of these interventions, like I said, can be adapted to the counseling room, maybe not fire kits, but we'll get into it. So first I wanna talk about finding meaning through nature. Frankel says that meaningfulness and thereby happiness um, can be a byproduct of an ability to transcend internal pleasure power needs and step beyond oneself, maintained by a sense of responsibility towards nature. Whoopsies. Experiences and feelings of connection with nature can facilitate rediscovery of who one is as a human being and their place in the world resulting in a sense of authenticity. Nature can elicit references to spirituality, but not in terms of religion, but in terms of a sense of wonder and amazement at how huge the world is and how we're a part of this beautiful construction. Nature is constant and permanent. For many teens, their environments are full of instability and anxiety. Experiences in nature bring them back to the simplicity of life, fosters presence and being in the moment, and teaches them there's beauty in everything, even things that were always there. And this is especially important in situations when you encounter a lot of uncertainty and stress. One of the tasks when I was in wilderness, we had to accomplish, accomplish each a bunch of tasks in order to graduate was to memorize three constellations. And I remember one night, maybe I think I was coming out of my little, little tarp and I was just having a really bad day and I was frustrated. I had a bad hike where it was work, like I hiked really hard, it was snowing, unending snow, and I was just frustrated. And I'll never forget just falling on my back and looking up at the stars and just the immense peace that I felt. 
and just the awe. And it was amazing. It created a really powerful coping mechanism for me in that day. And in the constellations, I saw stability and comfort. I knew that no matter what happened to me in the outside world, no matter how old I got, where I physically was, the stars would stay the same. To this day, when I'm experiencing stress, one of the best coping mechanisms for me is to just go outside and sit in silence and find constellations in the stars. And I'm constantly in awe of how small we are. Experiences and feelings of connection with nature can facilitate people rediscovering who they are as human beings and their place in the world, resulting in a sense of authenticity. Meaning can be created through the development of a coherent life narrative and by integrating personal events of an individual's life story into the context of the larger world. Having a reduction in stimuli either forced adolescents to look at where what was going on in their lives or allowed them to really explore themselves more. And when you're in the wilderness, you're responsible for your own basic needs for putting up tents and tarps for cooking food and ensuring that your supplies aren't taken by animals. Wilderness does not allow the option of not choosing and freezing because you will pay the consequences. So I just want to go back to this picture because um, this, like I said, I'm on the far left and you can see this green little sack on my back that's just hanging for dear life. And then on the far right, my friend Megan has her backpack all nicely tied up and rolled up. Um, all nice. And we would hike miles in this backpack that had tarp backpack that contained all of my materials for the week and was also what I would sleep under five out of seven nights of the week. So I would tie my tarp up with the rope and between two trees, I would throw it over, throw the tarp over the rope and hope that it didn't it didn't smell a bunch and then I would wake up and my tarp would still be okay. And then in the morning I would disassemble, you know, my sleeping tarp. I would put all my stuff in there and roll it up into this gross little burrito that you see right here. And I remember thinking to myself when they were first teaching me how to roll this backpack, okay, this doesn't make sense to me, but they'll teach me again, it's fine. So the information did not digest as thoroughly as it should have. And not having the tarp rolled correctly or the ropes together right meant that you were going miles and miles with all of your life just pressing into your back on rope, you know, with ropes that it hurt, it hurt. And guides will demonstrate how to fold and tie it maybe once or twice. As you can see with Megan, that's a beautifully guide tied backpack I remember very well. And after that, they would establish really right away that it's your responsibility and not paying attention at consequences. Nature is indifferent and it doesn't care. And I'll go back to my interventions. According to logotherapy, we find meaning not only by giving, but what we take from the world as well. Nature provides us with a stable, never changing beauty. There's beauty in everything if we look hard enough and allow ourselves to see it. I'll never forget one day when someone was refusing to move and we were unable to leave a specific campsite so we were not able to go get new food. We couldn't even light a fire and I spent the whole day sitting on the edge of this mountain writing in my really crispy dry journal and I remember nibbling on the corner of these moldy tortillas and attempting to eat oats with just cold water and it was disgusting but I remember being surprised at how not not happy I was. My breath was taken away by the view. I saw my future laid out in front of me and the peace that I felt was really beautiful. I didn't care about my moldy tortillas. I was happy to feel the sun, to watch the snow start to melt, and to know that tomorrow, if she was able to move, I would be able to sleep in a teepee by a fire. So now I'm gonna get into the authentic therapeutic relationship. And the relationship between the counselor and client is founded on the tenet of authenticity. And authenticity can create trust, which can serve a huge transformative role in creating relationships with these kids. Connecting with adolescents by gaining their respect and trust is a core existential technique and sets the groundwork for everything else. The therapist that I had at the time played a really vital role in my progress. His name was Dr. Fred. And I will never ever forget the first time that I met him and the first conversation that we had. Fred really put me in a place in a way that I so desperately needed at that time. 
it's been about eight years since I went to wilderness and Fred has stayed my therapist. And I always tell him he is my third favorite human in the entire world because he is. And I just connected so strongly with him that it really contributed significantly to my motivation to improve. Now I'm going to get into, oopsies, group dynamics. So these are just some pictures of me and my little group from when I was there. The dynamic of the group plays an important role in the therapeutic process as a group eventually becomes a little society where the members often interact with each other in the same way that they do other relationships in their lives. This manifests in the day-to-day -day wilderness process and provides countless opportunities for learning and corrective emotional experiences. Coming to wilderness, it didn't matter what you used to do in the real world. There you were stripped of the societal influences and left with just you. An important concept in existential theories is living authentically. And in wilderness, you learn how to live authentically by re literally removing yourself from the influence of society. And you have no reason to be anyone or anything other than yourself. You all wear the same exact clothes and you're all in the same boat. All that matters is your ability to keep the group moving forward. Group therapy cultivates countless moments for self-transcendence and promotes social support that shifts the adolescent from an egocentric worldview to one that's more community oriented. So after I was uh, there for about two weeks at the program, every single person had graduated, but me and my, my little friend, Megan, um, who on the bottom picture, she's on the far left. Um, usually the way that it works is that there's people who had been there for eight to even like, 16 weeks and would be mentors for the incoming students each each week and this time the new girls were met with just Megan and I as their leaders with very little wilderness experience and knowledge under our belts. It was minor chaos at first and eventually we learned to assimilate to our new role. I found myself wishing for the days only a week ago that there were people still there that were faster hikers or fire starters and I learned to find fulfillment in, in feelings of confidence and being able to mentor these new girls. The group contributed substantially to my ability to grow. And I felt like a leader and was really proud to be able to be the one to provide a fire and lead a hike. And I'm still, I think I'm Facebook friends with maybe a, couple, a small handful of these people. So now I'm going to talk about gratitude through de-reflection. And in Man's Search for Meaning, Frankel writes about his needs adapting and simplifying as he adjusted to life in the concentration camp. I had become convinced that there was certain things I could just not do. I could not sleep without this and I could not live without the other, says Frankel. Frankel was stripped of all of his earthly possessions, even his hair. He had no control, oopsies, he had no control over anything in his life and even his name was turned into a number. Frankel saw that even though he was surrounded by suffering and death, he still had control over the way that he chose to interpret and respond to his situation. His needs became simplified and things that used to matter like showers, fresh food and warm clothes became a fantasy. He learned to appreciate the extra bread chunk that a kind guard gave him or the boots that he had to take off of a dead man to keep his bare feet out of the snow. And wilderness gives the individual immense gratitude for their old way of living, even if they had previously thought they would want to be anywhere but. Professor Robert Emmons linked gratitude with a long list of health-related benefits, including stronger immune systems, lower blood pressure, more feelings of joy, more connection to others, and an overall greater sense of well-being. The bottom line is that being grateful is a gateway to a healthy life, having general gratitude for family and friends, but also gratitude for the small and simple things. Having everyday awareness of all that is good builds a grateful life. Frankel encouraged finding gratitude through de-reflection, which is a process where an individual consciously shifts their awareness to only acknowledge the positive aspects in their life. Um, even a few times a day, making your mind aware of what's going well and things that are beautiful help cultivate a mindset that is more open, positive, and receptive to the natural ebb and flow of reality. So I thought that these pictures were really interesting because there's a lot of very unique joy going on in here. On the far left, um, me and this little friend right here, we were always kind of one to just full speed ahead and just trudge, trudge, trudge. And I remember this day we got to the hike 
way before everyone else. And we were super happy that we had mobbed so hard and that the snow was melting. And we were actually, now that I'm thinking about it, actually I realized we're at the site um, for a story that I am about to, about to share with you. Um, and then on the far, the far right is very interesting. That was probably my last day I tried to use a hairbrush. And I remember feeling joy for being at a site that I enjoyed and having enough food in my bag to make myself a good meal. And joy for having a backpack instead of a tarp. Um, and as human beings, we are pre-programmed to search for negativity. We don't wake up in the morning thinking, I'm grateful that I don't have a stuffy nose. And then the moment you wake up with a cold, you can't think about anything else. When we notice that we're sick, we do what we can to remedy it. And sometimes you can't fix anything and the cold just won't go away. You have to accept that there's some suffering ahead of you that you cannot change. Frankel teaches to practice de-reflection in those moments where you intentionally shift your consciousness to another and more positive subject. Even a few times a day, making your mind aware of what's going well, such as your basic needs being met and things that are beautiful around you like nature, help cultivate a mindset that starts to see the world as half empty, but also half full. I just want to share the silly story about this, this picture. Um, I don't think my hair left my hair tie for the remainder of that program after this day. And a few days after my arrival, um, we had set up camp at a particularly unique site to me, which I, like I said, I think was this exact one in this picture. Um, I really liked it. I really liked the site for some reason. And I found, I remember roaming around for a place to set up my tent and I found an adorable little alcove with two perfectly sized trees, a perfect distance from each other. And I was so excited to find my spot and I claimed this spot. Um, as we were leaving that site, I pulled out my hairbrush from the depths of my backpack. And I remember laughing just at the sheer quantity of hair that was stuck to it. I pulled this monstrous hairball out and then laughed with my peers at just how disgustingly huge it was. Um, I remember yelling, wait, and ran back to my little, my little cove and placed the hairball in a very neat corner of a tree tucked between two branches. I remember smiling to myself and saying, I hope a family of squirrels makes a beautiful home out of you. When I started, I remember weeks later, when I started noticing markers that we were getting to the nearing the site, I knew exactly what to do. I went full speed ahead. I ran straight to my trees and to my joy, the same hairball was in the same exact spot almost two weeks, almost two or three weeks later. After weeks of sleet and snow and rain and sun, my hairball persevered. And never in my life did I think I would be so grateful to see a gross hairball. And I laughed so, so, so hard. Now I'm gonna talk about journal prompts. Wilderness is a really perfect setting to use journal prompts and stimulate reflection in adolescence. Prompts are a really great tool to use, especially with teenagers who might refuse to hear from a therapist or an adult and take it more seriously coming from them. Frankel frequently writes about the ability to choose your attitude, keeping an open mind and staying curious about the future because we have no idea what we're going to find or what's gonna to happen tomorrow. So we can focus on, all we can focus on is today while also being prepared for the future. For the adolescent, it can be really difficult to conceptualize the true size of their problems and they can be really life-changing in the moment. And so these journal prompts that I have on here are kind of existential prism e-based. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the as if and one year intervention. So the as if intervention was created by Frankel and it says to ask your clients to live life as if they were living the second time around and had already had the knowledge of the mistakes they made the first time. The one year intervention um, was created by me and I use this on my clients a lot. And I ask them, where were you one year ago today? You may have been experiencing another regular day, getting up and doing your normal routine. You may have even gone to sleep thinking about how boring your life is. And come back to now, did you think that any of the things that happened between now and that seemingly insignificant moment would have happened? Doesn't it feel like time went by in a flash? 
Time is a gift and it runs out quickly. If we forget to enjoy today, suddenly years are going to go by and we're going to feel more regret for not enjoying life while we could. Where do you think that you will be one year from now? What kind of person do you want to be? The one-year intervention helps to revitalize more enthusiasm for the future and really helps the adolescent put their, put their head down. I actually started doing this to myself. I remember when I got to wilderness, I knew that this was my life. And for an un for unknown amount of time, this was going to be my world. And so I knew that I wasn't going to be there for, I knew that in one year from now, I would be done with wilderness and I would have a, I would be in a different place in my life. So I broke it down even smaller. And I remember each week, each day I counted and I trudged through and I moved forward waiting for that time. So knowing that eventually something was going to change externally, the power, I accessed my internal power to control what I could and take care of myself at the same time. And I have a, I'll, I wanted to share a little bit about um, using that with a client. Um, I have a client who I'll call D and D is currently struggling with bipolar disorder and is coming out of a really deep depression, um, coming to terms with some past abandonment issues and battling self-harm. And she's 14. We frequently talk about the future and specifically events that are going to happen between today and one year from now. My client knows that without a doubt, in one year from now, they are going to be starting at a new high school, they're going to be able to drive a car, and they're going to be able to visit a family member in a different country that they've been really excited for. So my client's really excited for those things and knows that without a doubt, in, in one year, those things will happen. So that leaves a lot of space for everything else. Um, and so we lay out a few specific things that they had coming up and we reflect on the previous year too. Especially with COVID, every single human on this earth has had a life shift and no one could possibly predict the effect that the pandemic would have on our world. That being said, what do you think could happen to your life between now and then? And then this is a quick list of some books that are kind of existentially based and can be used with teenagers and all, I would say. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about fire kits. I wanted to talk about this last because it's a little bit more of a wildernessy specific kind of intervention, but it's very interesting, I think. So on the left, that's my dad and I doing a fire tandem, which is kind of the easiest way to do it. And then on the right is me attempting. And I think this actually was my only fire that I lit by myself. So glad it's documented. The adolescent is to locate, whittle, and create the fire kit themselves. And this can be an extremely frustrating process for most people. Most teenagers have never even tried to whittle, let alone make fire out of sticks. And now being told that you have to create your very own, um, the long thing is called a spindle. And the thing that my foot's on is called a fireboard. The bow is, you know, the longer, the long, or thing question mark and then there's the top piece and you push with the mutual force and you row the bow like that and eventually an ember kind of pops out and this can be an extremely daunting task especially watching the ease at which other people in the group were able to achieve I'll never forget seeing somebody do maybe three or four strokes and have an ember pop out very very discouraging and added on to that stress is the knowledge in the back of your mind that you needed not only create your own fire kit, but successfully create an ember in order to graduate the program. And no matter how frustrating this is, the individual is eventually able to create a wonky but viable fire board. This process stimulates thoughts of self-doubt and worry in the majority of those who are asked. And even just finishing and being able to see your completed vision is a extremely uniquely rewarding feeling. It stimulates confidence and a new form of joy. And not only does it stimulate the accomplishment and gratitude for nature to provide the materials, but it provides the individual with a tool to help themselves and the rest of the camp. So every night the participant is to practice making an ember on their fireboard. And you can give up pretty easily. When you're first trying, it feels more of a daunting task sometimes than actually even hiking a mountain. And you feel a ton of gratitude for the people that are actually able to create an ember and keep you warm. 
And then eventually through constant practice, you are able to gain those skills and be the one to help future participants feel gratitude for you for keeping everyone warm. And so these are some existential and eco-based activities that are specific for the counseling room. Um, first, mindfulness and meditation. You can use nature visualization as a relaxation tool. You can hold counseling sessions in natural areas, especially when the experience is debriefed by the counselor with a focus on existential issues. Horticulture, um, gardening can be full of rehabilitated plants that have healing properties and offer full sensory experience. The beautiful and peaceful design of gardening can promote health and well being. Teens tend to the gardens and in those roles, they experience what it's like to care for a living entity. And they get to cultivate the earth instead of battling their internal struggles. Watching their gardens flourish and grow can be incredibly empowering and life affirming. Teens and horticulture therapy is about seeing and understanding growth. These skills are then become transferable and applicable to their lives beyond the garden. The most commonly used type of animal assisted therapies are canine and equine assisted therapy. Literature reviews state that animals can be useful for educational and motivational effectiveness for participants. And so groups, um, you can support students with many aspects of meaning in as a school count, sorry, as a school counselor um, and identity by exploring avenues like suffering and challenging circumstances behavior and choices and connection with others and things that they care about. You can do team building activities within a school, um, collaborate with PE teachers. I just learned about something called the Savage Race, which is an obstacle course that goes around the world and not around the world, around America. And some, that's something you could kind of train for and work together. You could do de-reflection groups where the only rule is to not talk about, only talk about positive things, which can be tricky. Um, and I would recommend a lot of group work. Purvis is an adolescent um, researcher that I really like, and he said that adolescents can most effectively find meaning in their lives through interactions with peers in small group settings. He explained if a young person is to find answers to their problems, he will do so more quickly and genuinely through a community of logos. And he's not likely to find self-fulfillment in isolation nor in the crowd called the mass or the groups to escape the essence of our existence. The young person can best find himself in his relationship to an accountable community. And so to conclude, um, I want to close with a quick thought on free will. Frangle truly believed that no matter the human, no matter where you came from or what kind of upbringing you had, you have the ultimate choice in how you bear your burden. Frankel said that man has both potentialities within himself, which one is actualized depends on decisions and not on conditions. There is a potential for bad and good in all of us, and it is up to us to decide what we want to cultivate. We are always free to decide and change the course of action. We decide what kind of people we want to be by the daily choices that we make. And those decisions and choices are what give us free will and make us unique as humans. Every day, you're given the choice in how you bear your burden. We are meaning-oriented beings and we long for meaning. If we struggle, we become better. If we find something meaningful that fills the existential vacuum. And although Frankel struggled to have faith in humankind after um, the war, Frankel ended up through logotherapy, creating a theory of humanity that seeks to find the potential good and meaning for every person. And that's the basis of logotherapy, to look for the best in people. Frankel will quote, go, 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 go the question mark. Um, if you take a man as he is, you make him worse. If you take a man as he can be, you help him become who he can be, the best version of who he is. Frankel wasn't interested in the worst version of anyone or how we can analyze that. Frankel focused on the best version of you and acted as if you were already there. And this had a really uplifting effect on people. Still, Frankel wasn't one-sided and he didn't deny the hordes of humanity. He came out of some of the worst savagery done to humans. And Frankel would say, after all, it is man that Man is the being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also the being who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. 
There's a Hitler and a Mother Teresa in all of us, Frankel would say. And it's a personal decision which of the two we're going to let ourselves become. The human being is always good for a surprise. Thank you. And yes, I will share the PowerPoint. And I have time for any questions if anybody has any. Yes, I can send um, how we can access the PowerPoint. Is um, there a minimum age? Who's my lovely moderator? Oh, I yeah. can ask for assistance. I'm um, informed that. Alas, if you can send me emails, I have, um, if you could maybe send me an email, then I can send the PowerPoint and my resources um, in the chat. Thank you. I have a question. Um, what's the minimum age for and wilderness experience like that? I think the program could definitely work for veterans, veterans as well. It's been used for, um, it has been, I have read um, resources that said that it was used for those war veterans struggling with PTSD. I'll make sure I write everything down. No, I couldn't, I couldn't hear anybody. I'm copying emails right now. Thank you guys for coming. Tony, can you hear me? Thank you. I can hear you. Oh, I couldn't hear you, Shani. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was asking Hi. what's the minimum oh, no, I can't age? Hear you. Okay, so what? for some reason, Charlie can't hear us. Uh oh. Okay. So what's the minimum age of, of the individuals that can participate in a wilderness program like you experienced? Mm -hmm. So don't hate me, but I realized that my mute, my volume was on um, the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a you. Okie dokie, the minimum age for wilderness program, 12. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how long is it? It can be, I have heard of them being from four weeks to up to 16, even farther, th even farther than that. It's up to the kiddo. So when I was there, I had a list of uh, um, tasks that you have to accomplish. So mm -hmm. one of the things is lighting, being able to light a fire and through, so you have to accomplish those tasks in order to be able to graduate. And so for some, they get gooned and it can be a really kind of traumatizing experience, I think, being gooned. And so that process of like assimilating to the program can take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Personally, um, like I said, because I had had a little bit of a warning, I think it took me a, a bit of a quicker time to be like, okay, I need to just put my head down and just kind of grind through this. So that's why I got out. Um, at the program that I went to was supposed to be eight to 16 weeks and I actually got out in seven um, because of that. But for some, it can be a lot longer. Um, who, funds this, who funds this program? So um, it is funded. I have actually learned recently of some um, grants that they are incorporating at the time when I, um, was learning about it. And when I was starting, it was primarily funded by the parents and the caregivers. Um, so it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit pricey, but I do know that they are working on including some um, scholarships. And how can we register for a program? There are a variety of wildernesses out there from a, like I said, a variety of differences. There's one, if you wanted to have your child look into it, I would look into um, Pacific Quest. Um, it's called PQ and awesome, got it. 
And Pacific West has, I know that they're working on having more um, scholarships available and they, um, yeah. And so you can talk to, they also are, PQ is a site that you can get BBS hours too. So there are some places, so there are some places like that as well. This is the room moderator. I just wanted to let you guys know that the recordings will be made available. Um, Colleen is the one that's um, handling that. Um, so I assume that they'll be available where you logged in to register for the conference. Thank you all. I'm sorry my volume was turned off. That I will blame on telehealth. We've all been there. <laughs> Thank you. I personally very much enjoyed your presentation. I have been reading Frankel lately because um, we're doing um, human trafficking and talking about play therapy and logotherapy. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting to, to listen to you speak. Thank you. Thank you. It's kind of new. I've noticed there's not a ton of work in logotherapy and with the kiddos. And I think it's a really great time to start doing work about meaning. And I think it can be super preventative. So it's awesome that you guys are doing that. 